The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysig, my partner, Malik Hill. And we're in August. It's August 3rd, which means we have football this month. Kind of crazy to think that we're already back to football season, uh, but we're both pretty excited about that. But we do have a couple of news and notes to hit on before we get into the main college football conference of the day. Um, one of the greatest NBA players of all time, uh, if you're born in the 60s, you probably think he is the greatest basketball player of all time, Bill Russell. Probably will never be passed in championships. Won 11 rings with the Celtics. Um, yeah, finally passed away. He's been having some some health issues the last few years. I know that. Uh, so it's sad to see one of those legends go. He's like... Easily, well, I say easily probably top 10 player of all time. Um, and yeah, it, it's just crazy to think that, you know, a legend of the time is passing away. Granted, we've had guys like Kobe pass away that stinks just as badly. But um, I think Bill Russell's a little different because he was so early in the NBA and just dominated back in the day. Him and Wilt, I mean, he dominated Wilt technically. Um, maybe not statistically, but Bill Russell always had his number, and it was kind of those two guys that really, really got it going, especially especially for, like, the black athlete in the NBA, I would say. Um, and he just won constantly. And you watch, like, they have little videos of him back in the day here and there and nobody could stop Wilt in the NBA but Bill Russell could which is kind of crazy to think about and I think Bill Russell is one of those guys that gets overlooked especially by the younger crowd because there, there's a there's a whole new big group mm -hmm. of people that just completely trash where basketball started yeah and I, I can't get in that group I, I just can't right I get it to a certain degree but at the same time, like you have to acknowledge how skilled they were for the time. Because obviously the game's going to grow. The game's going to develop. People are going to learn new things. And it's just going to get better over time no matter what. For them to be doing that back then is incredible. That they, it, you know, people say it all the time. Like they paved the way for a lot of these big guys, um, especially. And yeah, his like Bill Russell doesn't have like crazy outlandish stats or anything. Yeah, he he was mainly known for the great defense, great rebounding, mm -hmm. and scoring when he had to. Right, but at the end of the day, he had a way to win. Granted, he also had some very good teammates, several still, Hall of Famers. But you still you still have to get it done. So yeah, uh, sad, unfortunate, but you know everybody's time has to come at some point. And I think he made an impact on the NBA. So yeah, he he's one of the last athletes of his age and of his kind in terms of players that were on the front lines in terms of like social issues mm -hmm. when they were like really heavy and really mattered at the time. Yeah, I think him, Jim Brown, and Kareem are probably the last. Were the last three left, and Jim Brown is eighty six. Kareem is in his 70s, I believe, and now Bill Russell is gone. So mm -hmm. there's really like two of the main ones left. Right. But, yeah, his his impact in terms of that and the social issues, he was an athlete of today in, in, in the 50s and 60s game, him and Wilt Chamberlain, 
Like you watch, it's a clip that's going around that I couldn't find forever when he played at San Francisco where he gets a rebound on defense, takes three dribbles from the opposing basket and takes off almost from the free throw line Mm -hmm. and just like flies over someone and just like finger rolls it at the, like he was a insane level athlete for his time. Right. And it showed when he played in the NBA, Mm -hmm. what him and Bob Cousy and Red Auerbach and all of them were able to accomplish 11 rings and then he became a player coach yeah. and won another ring. I can't I think I can't remember if it was another two, but I I'm, he won another one as a player coach. Mm-hmm. He is the Celtic. He is a staple of the NBA. And he he just he he meant so much to the league and to players today. Mm-hmm. Like when Kevin Garnett came to the Celtics, he was Kevin Garnett's like main mentor when he first got there. Right, and there's an interview you can watch of them too, that's uh on YouTube and online all over the place. That's almost like brings a few tears to your eyes. Seeing like how much Bill Russell, like how much Kevin Garnett meant to him, mm-hmm. and how much belief he had in Kevin Garnett, and a lot of those Celtics legends. He was a great dude, a great player, and yeah, mm-hmm. this tough loss to the NBA community. Yep, he's one of the greatest. Yeah, but again. Luckily, you know, he made his mark. So, um, and then from somewhat sad news to like sad news in the other aspect, the NFL has had to deal with some, some legal battles recently and it, it's interesting. I, I, I don't know what to think because, you know, I'm not in that, <laughs> not in that career path. So I don't know if how much my opinion really is fully valid, but anyway, I'll start with the the lighter thing. The dolphins uh, lost a first and a third round pick, I believe uh, for illegal tampering with Tom Brady and Sean Payton in the off season of uh, 2019, I believe going into 2020. And so they lost those. The weird thing is they still kind of, brushed the like uh tanking where supposedly Brian Flores would get incentives if his team lost but he said he wasn't going to do it. Yeah. Uh so they still kind of like kind of washed that away so that was weird. Um and then of course the big one Deshaun Watson finally got his suspension and it's 6 games. And this is where I'm really kind of confused because I understand that there was a lot of um, settlements that were made. Uh, Some of the women came out and they said that it really wasn't that bad. I don't know if that's because they got money at some point. I don't know. I I don't know full details, of course. Um, But at the same time, there was still enough evidence that the, so, if anybody doesn't know, the NFL has now outsourced their legal issues to a certified judge. And then she makes the ruling and kind of gives them a decision. So, she's basically the one that has come up with this six-game suspension. But at the same time, in her findings, now I haven't read them in detail. I've mostly heard from you know ESPN and other news outlets that... She said that there was enough evidence for like sexual misconduct and things like that. So to me, if there was enough evidence, why is he only getting six games? And now that the thing that everybody's going to do, obviously, is you're going to compare it to other suspensions. Calvin Ridley. Whole year. Whole season. Got a whole year for gambling. Now, originally, I was totally fine with the Calvin Ridley suspension because, you know, it's in the rules. It's, you know, it sucks. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I get why he got a year. Now I don't like it at all because you're comparing it to Deshaun Watson, who did something, in my opinion, (laughs) is much worse, and he only got six games. Now, again, I don't know the full details, so I can't say, like, that he did everything wrong and Deshaun Watson's a terrible person. That may not fully be the case. But if a judge is saying that there was enough evidence, I would think there would be a harsher suspension. Just have him sit out a year. 
he screwed up either way. And I don't know. It just doesn't line up. And the hard part is, too, now the NFL, they could appeal it and they could give him more. But then you're basically saying, oh, this judge that we outsourced because we had problems in the past isn't working out. So now we're going to go against what she said for the first time that we've actually used her and appeal it. I I can't see them doing that. So I feel like once again, the NFL has put themselves in a terrible position with these suspensions and criminal rulings and things like that. What's uh, your take? I let you (laughs) chime in. In the past decade, the NFL, Roger Goodell, all the powers that be, they've made it clear that the morals within the league and within the rules and the systems of the league have been placed above regular everyday just life morals. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to go super deep into it, but you have the Colin Kaepernick situation Mm -hmm. where he stood for what he stood for, took a knee. It was pretty much ousted and has never gotten another chance. And then they do the things where teams start taking knees together and they do the collective NFL racial supportive things, which are, we we know, mainly just, it's not genuine. (laughs) It didn't seem genuine. You you have to go as far as Ray Rice or Henry Ruggs. Mm -hmm. It has to be true, like, Guilty, you did something terrible, you're out of the league. Right. To get real serious consequences. Josh Gordon has gotten 25 games, I think, total for all of his marijuana stuff. Which now, he was a repeat offender, so, you know, that's partially on him. But at the same time, even his original suspension was pretty harsh, I think, for at the time. Yeah, it's it, it really is strange that Calvin Ridley, even though... When it first was happening, he was saying he was he did nothing wrong, mm-hmm. and it came out that he he actually he he admitted to what he did. I it it makes no sense. He did he didn't do anything crazy wrong, mm-hmm. in my opinion, and I think in most people's opinions. A year long suspension for that. It's. I I I don't I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to go too deep into it. I'm just gonna say, what what I said from the start. It's clear that the what the NFL. If you go against the shield, mm-hmm. and what the NFL stands for within their group, yeah. that's worse than anything else. Right. And I I don't think that's gonna change mm-hmm. anytime soon. So I I don't know. It yeah. it's it's really strange. It really is. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's just, it's weird. It's unfortunate. There's going to be, I, I mean, it's going to be weird even just at any Cleveland game. I'm sure there's going to be signs and other stuff going on. I don't know. It's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. Um, like I said, the NFL still does have a chance to appeal, but I, I just don't see it happening. Um, and we'll see. I I know Cleveland's going to be happy about it because, you know, they, they're they only going to lose Deshaun Watson for six games. Um, And like I said, I don't want to say, like, for certain that Deshaun Watson is this terrible guy and that he did this and didn't do that or whatever. Um, But at the same time, at least there's enough evidence to even suspend him that I feel like six games just isn't enough comparatively when you look at other suspensions. But that's just my opinion. Anyway, like we said, NFL football is coming back. The first preseason game, the Hall of Fame game, um, which to me doesn't really matter at all. It's a weird game to begin with. Uh, They just cut a preseason game out this year or last year, so they're only playing three preseason games instead of four like they used to, except unless you're a Jacksonville Jaguar or, an Oak, or a Las Vegas Raider. 
Just seems kind of weird to me. I don't know. Doesn't matter. Trevor Lawrence isn't going to play. Travis Etienne's not going to play. Uh, the Raiders, I mean, they're starting line. They might play a drive. I don't know. Um, but we'll see. And if anything, NFL football is back. It's exciting. Last thing I want to touch on really quick, too. Kyler Murray uh, got an extension with the Cardinals. And he had a homework clause in it where he had to study plays and things like that and film for so many hours at certain times. Uh, the Cardinals received a lot of backlash off that. Then they uh, got rid of it. So it's a bad look for them to even have that in there that saying that their quarterback doesn't do enough film study or whatever. It's just, it's odd. Yeah, it's, to me, it's obviously there for a reason. But why get why put that out into the public instead of just, why not just meet with him and have a conversation about it? Right. Why does it have to be a clause in a contract? That's one, that's one I, I really don't understand. And like you said, very embarrassing mm-hmm. for an organization that's trying to get into the the next level of the NFL. But when you do stuff like this, you're still seeing as the same the same old Cardinals when you do stuff like this. Yeah. Mishandling players and in contracts and different things. So I, I guess it's good that they took it back, but doing it in the first place, yeah. Right. It's one of those things the damage has already been done by putting it out there. So at this point, I don't know. It's just weird. It's a weird scenario. All righty. Let's get into the next conference of college football. What do you got for us, Malik? This week is the Big 12, a conference that appears to be being left behind, (laughs) even though I I like the fact that BYU is coming into the Big 12, Cincinnati, UCF. I like the schools that are coming in. Mm Mm-hmm. But I it I don't know if they're going to be included. It seems like they're not going to, going to be included as one of the so so called super conferences if that's where we're heading. But we're not there yet. Texas and Oklahoma are still in the Big Twelve, mm-hmm. and even though Baylor won the conference last year, they deserve a ton of respect for what they did last year. We're going to start with some of the hype. Last year I started with the respect of Utah. This year I'm going to go with the a, a bit of the clickbait. Texas. Oh boy. Is Texas back? No. Is this the year? Like last year or the year before or the year before that or the year before that one? I will say that they're probably closer than they have been, but I don't know. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it kind of thing. So so here's the thing with Texas. Steve Zarkeesian, second season. He did not live up to the hype of season one. They went five and seven. They lost six straight for the first time in I can't remember how many years in a Texas season. Mm -hmm. But there was a video that dropped later in the season last year of a one of the coaches on the team just completely going off and snapping on the players on a on a bus ride. Yeah. From a game. A whole lot of cuss words in there. (laughs) So I'm not going to go with specific quotes. But the main gist of the entire explosion from the coach was. How many of you actually care about this program? Mm -hmm. How many of you care about Texas football? How many of you want to be great? How many of you want to be champions? Yeah. And I loved it because to me, that's been the main problem with Texas over the past decade plus. Mm -hmm. Since 2009, when they lost to Alabama, caught, caught McCoy's last season, lost in the national championship. It's been all hype and no real buy-in. Or expectation. Yeah. They've recruited at a high level, but I believe most of the kids they've they've recruited have come to Texas just to be Texas football players. And in Mac Brown's last few years at Texas, there was no direction. There was no guidance. And there was was just talent just for talent's sake. Right. And that's what it's been for the last decade. Mm -hmm. Now, they made small steps. In there with their coaches before Steve Sarkeesian. But they're going all in now. That's It appears that they're going all in. Right. Steve Sarkeesian was the offensive coordinator at Alabama for a few years before he came to Texas. His team's put up huge numbers, Heisman winners, national championships. 
So, off of last season, Casey Thompson was the starting quarterback. He's gone. He transferred to Nebraska. You bring back B. John Robinson, who is one of the best running backs in the country. Mm-hmm. He's an absolute beast. Xavier Worthy, who was a who was at Michigan for about a week or two and transferred to Texas. Heartbreaking for me, but a huge plus for Texas because he was their leading receiver from the jump. Yeah. Probably their best freshman receiver that they had in program history last year. He lit up their game against Oklahoma, had a bunch of big games throughout there. He's back. And they brought in a ton of transfers Mm -hmm. to try and fix what is missing with the roster they had last season. Some of the guys they bring in have a few red flags. You got a Jai Hall from Alabama a guy who kind of quit on Nick Saban at Alabama and Nick Saban just stopped playing him. Mm -hmm. Jaleel Billingsley, a tight end from Alabama who had crazy talent, but also got into it with Nick Saban and left. (laughs) They both followed Steve Sarkeesian to Texas. Isaiah Nair, a wide receiver from Wyoming who's getting a ton of hype. He's like 6'4", 220. Mm -hmm. Big body, can make big plays. But the main guy, the pride of Texas, who chose not to come to Texas last year as a true freshman. Got to make that money. And went to Ohio State as an early enrollee, Mm -hmm. Quinn Ewers. Besides Justin Fields and uh, Trevor Lawrence, probably the third highest rated quarterback they've had in like the past decade or like plus. Yeah. The hype is real. His arm is insane. He barely has to drop back and he can fling it almost 60 yards. He has a blonde mullet. His aesthetic and his talent has Texas fans drooling. And like you said, money, money, money. He went to Ohio State and just got a million-dollar NIL deal and then left him and came back home. Yeah. So the hype is back again. You got a bunch of skill talent. The defense is once again a question mark. The only noteworthy player, honestly, coming back on this defense is DeMarvian Overshown who's in his fifth year, I believe, one of the hype players from the past who's been around forever. Mm -hmm. He's going to be their starting middle linebacker, super athletic, can make big plays. But there's question marks everywhere else. Yeah. No real real major pass rush. Their tackling was horrible all season. They gave up big points to several teams. The The tackling was awful all over the place. And they just have to figure that out. They're going to rely on the offense to do a lot all season. Now, looking at their schedule, it's not easy. No. Week one, you got UL Monroe. That's a win. Mm -hmm. That should gain you some confidence. Whether it's Quinn Ewers or, I forgot to mention, Hudson Card, who did start some games last year as a freshman for Texas. It'll be him and Quinn Ewers battling, but most people assume Quinn Ewers will be the starter. Right. First week, UL Monroe, Hudson Carter and Quinn Ewers will probably put up, both have really impressive numbers that first week. But week two, (laughs) you got Bama coming to Texas. Roll Tide. (laughs) You got Nick Saban coming in, and most people don't expect it to be pretty. Mm -hmm. Saban has a history of putting it on his old coaches and coordinators. Last year against Lane Kiffin in Ole Miss, he put it on Lane Kiffin. And I expect him to do the same. Yeah. So, one and one start. They got UTSA at home. That should be a win. On the road at Texas Tech. Could be difficult. West Virginia should be a win. Oklahoma, toss-up. Iowa State could be difficult. Oklahoma State on the road could be difficult. Kansas State on the road could be difficult. (laughs) Should be TCU, should be Kansas. Although they've lost to Kansas twice in the past five years. Mm Mm-hmm. And you end at home against Baylor, which also isn't easy. Yeah. They're not winning the conference, in my opinion. <laughs> this, this this schedule is not easy at all. I don't expect Quinn Ewers to just become a Heisman candidate all of a sudden, even though he has insane talent. Mm-hmm. If they win eight games, this is a major successful season. Yeah. Just winning eight is a big success. Big success. If they go seven and five, I think there should be good takeaways. Mm-hmm. 
is coming off of a five and seven season, making a bowl game for Texas right. is a plus. Yeah. You make a bowl game, it should be a positive. Even though the expectations are super high, I expect seven or eight wins. Mm. If they hit nine, that'd be great. That'd be an incredible season. I don't expect them to hit 10. Yeah. The defense will still be inconsistent. I still don't know if they can even tackle consistently. But they should put up a lot of points against several teams. And there's always next year. There's always next year. Arch Manning's right around the corner. Yeah, but yeah, Texas Tech's defense shouldn't be anything special. West Virginia's defense is pretty good, but their offense, Mm -hmm. nobody knows what JT Daniels is going to really do for them. Iowa State is in somewhat of a retool season, so... Yeah. TCU's retooling. Kansas is Kansas. And that last game against Baylor is at home. They should be fully formed by then. Yeah. So I'm giving them eight wins, which is a successful season to me for Texas. Yeah. Do you think the same pretty much? I would say so. Don't believe in the super hype. Again, like like you said, Texas, we keep hearing that they're going to be good. Haven't seen it yet. So, again, I'll believe it when I actually see it. But I am interested to see Quinn Ewers play because I felt like it was kind of weird. Goes to Ohio State, makes his money, transfers. Yeah. I mean, he figured out the system already. But It's a smart move, yeah. a red flag to some people, but yeah, he's back home. Most people don't expect him to leave at this point. Yeah. Curious to see how he does, though. But there's a chance they could start 4-1. and one. The Alabama game is a loss, but UL Monroe, UTSA, Texas Tech on the road won't be easy, but they've got a new head coach. Mm -hmm. You should be able to put up a lot of points on them, and West Virginia at home shouldn't be a major challenge. Could start 4-1. and Yeah. So, yeah, could get to eight wins. Good season for Texas. Let's not go too crazy. Next up, the Oklahoma Sooners. Big news in the offseason. Nobody expected it. Lincoln Riley leaves Oklahoma Mm -hmm. and goes to USC. Oklahoma goes into their memory bank for the bowl game especially because they they brought back – Jeez, my my memory in names it's it's so awful. They're the legendary coach that won them a national championship and won several Big Twelve championships. I apologize, but after that they go into a coaching coaching search, and they go with a name that is very relevant to Oklahoma football in the past twenty years. Brent Venables, former defensive coordinator during the, the uh, Sam Bradford years and those mid to late 2000s teams. Bob Stoops. Bob Stoops, <laughs> yes, thank you. Bob Stoops coached the football, the bowl game, helped lead the coaching search, and they bring in Vin- Brent Venables, who's been known as the top defensive coordinator in football mm-hmm. for the past five, six years for Clemson. He's recruited a ton of high-level players, put a bunch of them in the NFL, and they won two national championships. He's back home in Norman. And with him coming in, several players left. Yeah. Especially who Oklahoma saw as the golden child last year, benching Spencer Rattlers early in the season and raising up Caleb Williams, who was a five-star quarterback from D.C. that came in. Mm -hmm. He has a lot of hype this season based off of what I think was a small sample size of great moments. Oklahoma fans are already just trashing Lincoln Riley and, and Caleb Williams constantly mm-hmm. <laughs> saying they're better, better off with Brent Venables. It's just sour fan stuff. Right. But who knows? Oklahoma could be better than USC this season, at least in year one. Because mm-hmm. even though Caleb Williams left, they brought in a really good quarterback of their own in Dylan Gabriel a transfer from UCF. He's been one of the best quarterbacks in the group of five over the past two or three seasons. Mm -hmm. Not a big quarterback. He's around 5'11", 6'0", 
like 190 something pounds, but he's a lefty and he can sling it. Mm-hmm. One of the best deep balls in the game. He's very accurate on his deep ball. His short and inter- short and intermediate. He's he's accurate, but he's not like super super accurate. Mm-hmm. His deep ball is the best part of his game, which should help because they also bring in offensive coordinator Jeff Lebby, who was at Ole Miss with Lane Kiffin, and before that was Dylan Gabriel's offensive coordinator at UCF before Scott Frost left in Nebraska. So Jeff Levy and Dylan Gabriel are on the same page. I'm sure it's going to take a little bit of time to refresh, but it shouldn't take that much. Yeah, They're comfortable with each other. It's the main reason why Dylan Gabriel came to Oklahoma. It shouldn't be a, uh, a ton of time to adjust. Now, in terms of skill talent, they don't have any dominant running backs like they've had in the past. They have Eric Gray, who was good last season but not great. I think they'll have to rely more on their passing game. They return Marvin Mims, who has been a breakout candidate in the Big 12 in terms of receivers for the past two seasons. He had a really good freshman season, kind of a step back last season, but had a great finish to the season. Mm -hmm. They're looking at him to be the number one. And they also bring back Theo Weiss, who's been there for three years also. Bigger body receiver, 6'3", 200-something pounds. Mm -hmm. Them two will be the main top guys. They did lose Jaden Hazelwood to Arkansas. He transferred once Lincoln Riley left and went to Arkansas. But they bring in uh, Javian Hester from Missouri, a guy who was highly recruited but didn't get a ton of time. He's only like a redshirt freshman. LV Bunkley Shelton, a same type of guy from Arizona State, highly recruited, hasn't played a ton, has a bunch of promise. So outside of those two guys, they have high level of talent, but nothing proven. Because they have Dylan Gabriel and Jeff Lebby, I think that it won't take much to figure it out. Now on the defensive side, this is where Oklahoma fans expect some improvement. Mm -hmm. Because Brent Venables is a defensive guy and has been for a long time, going back to when he was the defensive coordinator for that team. Now, when you look at their defense, they honestly don't have a bunch of super notable like star players. That's where Brent Venables is going to have to work some of his magic. They improved as a defense last year after years of just giving up so many points under Lincoln Riley. I think they were like a top 50 defense, but Oklahoma fans want more. More of what they've had in the past where they did have some monster players on defense and high-level defensive ratings. Right. So... There are a few freshman players that I think will make a bit of a difference. One of them is Jaron Kanak, or Kanak. Not sure how to pronounce it yet. We'll figure out once he starts playing. Kid from Kansas, who was a high-level uh, linebacker recruit, committed to Clemson, backed out on signing day and enrolled at Oklahoma. He had a lot of buzz, played a lot during the spring ball. He should play a lot during the season. He's an old-school type linebacker, a thumper. He's really athletic. He can run fast. But he he just takes heads off. Mm-hmm. He'll get a few flags called on him during the freshman season for being too aggressive, and that's fine because he's super talented. But, yeah, when you look at their schedule, honestly, it's not a rough start. They got UTEP week one, Kent State week two. They go to Nebraska which a lot of people in Nebraska think they can upset Oklahoma. We'll get to that when we get to the Big Ten previews. It could be a chance, but we'll see. And then they have Kansas State at home week four. Kansas State has beaten them two out of the past three times they've played them. So it won't be easy. Mm -hmm. But they got Adrian Martinez at quarterback. We'll get to them. They could start 4-0. And they have TCU week five, could start 5-0. Yeah. Honestly, I think it's going to be 4-1. and one. I think they drop Kansas State and Nebraska. But then you go into the Red River rivalry against Texas. It's always a 50-50 game. Yep. Should beat Kansas, even though Kansas gave them a bit of a scare last year. Should beat Kansas. Road game against Iowa State could drop it, but I think they win it. Yeah. Game against Baylor. I think they lose that one. I think Baylor clips them up on the road. I think they beat West Virginia on the road. I think they beat Oklahoma State. Hmm. I think they beat them, and I think they beat Texas Tech on the road. 
This could be a 10-win Oklahoma team. Okay. I expect at least nine. I think they could hit 10 in year one under Brent Venables. I think they're in the Big 12 championship most likely. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think Texas has it yet. I trust Dylan Gabriel, especially him with Jeff Lebby. I think Brent Venables will have that defense playing hard and disciplined. And with the way the schedule starts, I think they'll be battle-tested enough after the Texas game and the Kansas State games to be ready for what comes later in the schedule. Hmm. Possible 10-win season for Oklahoma. Great start for them. Yeah. In my opinion. Hmm. I mean, if their defense can improve, you know, that's kind of the only thing that's been missing the last few years, so... That would be the way that they could get back. But I don't know. I'm always skeptical of the Big 12 just in general. Yeah. they uh, Defense has never been a <laughs> – hasn't been their thing in the past decade for the most part. Besides TCU having their few years and Oklahoma State coming back recently. But, yeah, I expect Oklahoma to be pretty good in their first season. Hmm. Next up, Oklahoma State. They made it all the way to the Big 12 championship last season. They came up a yard short. Got to the goal line. Baylor stopped them very short. Ended up, like I said, coming short. A lot of people predicted that could be the last season could be the season where they made a run to the uh, college football playoff. They would have had a chance if they beat Baylor last season. But, yeah. So, they come in this season. They lose their defensive coordinator to Ohio State. And the guy they bring in, I'm not sure if he's going to be just a seamless transition. And they've also lost some players on defense like Malcolm Rodriguez, who was their leader on defense, Lions draft pick, middle linebacker. Mm -hmm. They do return some talent, though. They lose some talent. They they lose some talent. They return some. They got one of the best young DNs in the Big 12, a guy that had a high number of sacks last season. They returned Spencer Sanders, who hasn't lived up to his recruiting rankings and high level of talent fully yet. He has moments where he looks great, and he has moments where everybody wants him benched at Oklahoma State. Yeah. Yeah, he'll he'll have games where, like in the Big 12 championship, he throws three picks. But in their, their bowl game against Notre Dame, he looked like an absolute star. He threw three or four touchdown passes, only one pick, and just aired it out on Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. They need to get a consistent Spencer Sanders to have a season even close to what they had last season because they still have skilled talent in the receiving core. They lose their main guy, but they still bring back young guys in uh, brothers Blaine and uh, Bryson Green, I believe, twin brothers. Mm -hmm. They've they've got a bunch of guys in the receiving core. They lose uh, Jalen Warren as their big go-to running back. They're going to go running back by committee most likely. I'm not sure about Oklahoma State. Because they have to replace defensive coordinator and several key players. They got Central Michigan week one. They had that wacky game a few years ago where Central Michigan beat them on the Hail Mary. That shouldn't have counted. But I'm sure they won't be very afraid. They Mm -hmm. should win that game. They should beat Arizona State. They should beat Arkansas Pine Bluff. I think they lose at Baylor week four. Okay. Texas Tech week five could be a challenge. I think they beat them. Go to TCU. I think they win that game. They could lose the game against Texas. I think they lose at Kansas State. Kansas shouldn't be taken lightly later in the season. Hmm. This is Kansas we're talking about, but last season – their last four games, I believe they only lost by like like single digits in their last four games. Mm-hmm. Can't take Kansas lightly on the road. Should win. They could get clicked up by Iowa State. I think that, like I said, I think they lose to Oklahoma. And who knows what JT Daniels is going to do at West Virginia, but I think they most likely win that game. Right. So it could be Baylor loss could be a Texas loss. I think it's Kansas State loss. I think they lose to Oklahoma. Could lose to Iowa State. I see most likely 8 and 4 could hit 9 and 3. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I see them in Texas kind of being around the same place in terms of record and maybe quality of team. Yeah. Cause, but it, it all depends on Spencer Sanders and if he could hit that level. Because if he does, he has the running ability, he has the arm. If he cuts down the turnovers and makes those big highlight plays, they could be a 9-win team, potentially 10, that gets back to the championship. But I don't, I don't expect it. Mm-hmm. I don't really expect it. So, after Oklahoma State, Baylor. The team that won it last year under second-year head coach Dave Aranda. He made a lot out of uh, – actually, they had a pretty talented roster because a lot of those guys got drafted in this last draft. I believe in Dave Aranda as a coach and what he did last season, reshaping the offense after year one where they had just a completely ugly offense. Mm-hmm. They bring back quarterback Blake Shapin after him starting, I think, four games last season when Jerry Bohannon was hurt. He played those games as a freshman, looked really impressive, looked even more impressive in the Big 12 championship game. And it was supposed to be a quarterback battle coming into the season with him and Jerry Bohannon. But in the spring, Dave Aranda just outright decided Blake Shapin was the guy. Mm-hmm. So Jerry Bohannon leaves and transfers to South Florida. Blake Shapin as a sophomore, is the is now the guy. I think he's really talented. He has to show over a whole season what he can do. Has to be like consistent throughout a season. But he has great touch on his passes. He has a lot of arm talent. He's really smart in the pocket. He's not a scrambler, but he can move. He's very mobile. I like him at quarterback. Yeah. Now the rest of the roster is a complete retool. <laughs> You lose multiple NFL draft picks out of the defense. You lose a few guys off the offense, including the running back rushed for 1,600 yards last season. Mm -hmm. They had a receiver that was drafted by the Patriots, who was their big speed guy. They're replacing all their big names. Yeah. And like I said, even though I believe in Dave Aranda, this is going to be a major retool season for him. Right. You beat Albany week one, but then you go to BYU, and I think you lose that game. You beat Texas State week three. You go to Iowa State week four. That could be a real toss-up. I'm going to guess. I I think I said. I'm going to guess Baylor wins that one. Okay. But then you got Oklahoma State. I think Oklahoma State could win that one. Mm -hmm. I think they beat West Virginia at West Virginia. They could beat Kansas, but Kansas could be a could be a trip up team. I think they could lose at Texas Tech. I think they lose at Oklahoma. I think they lose to Kansas State. I think they beat TCU and Texas is a toss up. So that's around seven or eight wins, maybe. Yeah. I'm thinking most likely seven. Because there are going to be a lot of teams later in the schedule, even in the middle of the schedule, that could trip them up if they're not on their game. And they have so many young guys that they're going to have to depend on once that Big 12 schedule starts. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea how ready they'll really be. Right. So I'm going to really, I'm going to most likely go with seven and five, even though I believe in Dave Aranda and that program. Yeah. That's going to be a big drop off from last year. Yeah. It's, It's still progress. They're doing a great job recruiting. They have one of the top quarterbacks in this class already committed and he said he's sticking with Baylor. He's picked up a bunch of offers after the Elite 11 Mm. but he said he's sticking with Baylor at least for now. So there's still a lot of progress. They could win eight games but um, I'll see more seven. Gotcha. Next, Iowa State. Brock Purdy is gone. Brees Hall is gone who was really just their guy for the past three, four years. Yep. It won't be easy to replace them at all. It might be kind of easier to replace Brock Purdy because I think he peaked during his freshman season. He came in with no expectations and just took everything over. Right. Took the world by storm. They won eight games and surprised everybody. He was kind of better as a sophomore, but as a, as a junior and senior, he just never took that next step. Mm-hmm. 
The quarterback they have coming in now is Hunter Deckers, a big 6'3", almost 230-pound guy, left-handed. He has a lot more throwing arm talent than Brock Purdy. Yeah. So I think they could take a bit of a step forward with him. But losing Brees Hall, he accounted for over 4,000 yards over the past four seasons, three, four seasons. Yeah. He was just their go-to guy when everything's got tough. And and we saw in the NFL draft, the Jets, they drafted Michael Carter last year, who a lot of us thought was going to be that main guy. And then they saw Brees Hall was available in their draft, and they just took him, yeah. even though it wasn't necessarily a position of need. That just tells you how good Brees Hall yeah. is. From day one, he was a workhorse for Iowa State and just kept it going. He's gone. They have veteran Jarrell Brock, who was also a highly recruited running back in the same class as Brees Hall. Mm -hmm. But as soon as Brees Hall got his chance, he just took it over and never like gave it back. Yeah. Not sure what, what Jarrell Brock will do for them. It's kind of going to be running back by committee with him and a few other young guys. Mm-hmm. I think their O line is still going to be pretty good, but we'll have to see. Right. See how much they can pick up the slack with all that production being gone. They return several receivers. None of them are really huge big play guys, but they've been consistent for them. Right. They're going to need one of those guys to step up. Like Xavier Hutchinson has been there. This is his third year at Iowa State. He's a fifth year guy. He should be expected to step up and have a bigger season. Jalen Noel is another guy who's – he's a faster option. He's the speed guy. They use him in reverses and, like, slants and stuff, screens. He should have some big plays. The offense could be pretty good. Now the thing with the defense is they lose so many key pieces. Right. They lose Mike Rose at linebacker. They lost their key safety. They're starting safety for the past two, three years. He's gone to the NFL. They lost a defensive lineman. I think it'll be hard to retool with that because they're their program that doesn't really like they they really have to develop. They can't bring in just freshmen and sophomores that are studs. Yeah. Now they occasionally have that, but they they really have to develop. So they'll have to depend on a few juniors and seniors and a few transfers that they brought in to help uh like lessen the the load. Mhm. Mm their schedule, they start off with Southeast Missouri State. That's a win. Week two at Iowa. I want them to beat Iowa. Like I, the past few seasons, I predicted them to do it, and they just can't. <laughs> they always figure out a way to lose against Iowa, so I don't think they're going to do it this year, right. especially at Iowa. Week three against Ohio, win. Week four against Baylor. I said it would be a tough one for Baylor, but it's a bit of a toss-up. Baylor could win it. Yeah. The game against Kansas won't be easy, but I think they take it. I think they lose to Kansas State. They could lose to Texas. I think they probably do. I think they lose to Oklahoma. Yeah. Could beat West Virginia. I think they most likely get that one. The Texas – well, I, I skipped over a game. The Oklahoma State game, I think they most likely lose that one. Texas Tech, it's a toss-up. Mm -hmm. They could kind of be like equally – good teams around that part of the season. So I'm not sure about that one. And then the ending game against TCU, that's a bit of a toss up for me too. So this kind of, this could be more of a, like this could be a six and six season for Iowa state, which isn't terrible because their history isn't great. <laughs> Matt Campbell has made them a good program right out of absolutely nothing. So them regressing to six and six or seven and five shouldn't be a red flag. It's just the fact that they've lost so much and they have to retool what they've done. Right. So they, I think they still potentially make a ball game, but just barely. Yeah. Just barely. Next up is the sleeper of the conference to me, the Kansas State Wildcats. Chris Kleeman is in his third year as coach, third or fourth. I can't remember which one. But. They bring back Deuce Vaughn, who's – honestly, if people haven't watched him, they need to. He's one of the most exciting running backs in college football. I'm not going to say he's just like Darren Sproles because they're both small and went to Kansas State. <laughs> he's just as good as as Deuce, as uh, Darren Sproles was at Kansas State. And I think he's going to be another one of those small backs that can play in the league. Mm -hmm. 
He's only 5'7", but he's strong. He's fast. He's elusive. And he can catch out of the backfield. He can just do it all. He's an All-American level running back. And after losing their quarterback from last year, they bring in Adrian Martinez from Nebraska. A guy that can never live up to the hype at Nebraska. Came in as a freshman. Was seen as the guy that could bring them into the next era with Scott Frost. It never happened. Mm -hmm. Never even made a bowl game. I have a feeling he can finally... I don't think he's going to break out as like a high, high level quarterback, mm -hmm. but I think him and Deuce Vaughn mesh and he has a good amount of time with that old line and he has good enough skill talent around him to just be a good, consistent quarterback and his running element can help them too in the read option with him and Deuce Vaughn. I was going to say his game might just cater towards the big 12 a little bit more that, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's hard to do in the big 10. So, you know, maybe with, more offensive schemes and things and not as much defense, honestly, in the Big 12. It might just He might just be better in this system. Yeah. I, like I said, I think they are the biggest sleeper. They also return a lot on defense. They only lost a few pieces. South Dakota State week one, I mean, South Dakota week one win. Missouri comes to Kansas State week two. I think that's a win. I think they beat Tulane. Like I said, they could really challenge Oklahoma, but I think Oklahoma wins that. Mm -hmm. I think they beat Kansas State week five. That's four and one. I think they beat Iowa State week six. That's five and one. I think they beat TCU week seven. I think that's six and one. Hmm. I think they surprise everybody and start six and one. Now, I think Oklahoma State can trip them up. Mm -hmm. They very well could. Texas could trip them up, but I think Kansas State wins that one. So that's like 7-2. and two. They could lose at Baylor, but I'm going to say Kansas State wins 8-2. and two. I think they go to the, on the road and beat. Actually, I think this is one that slightly trips them up. <laughs> I think JT Daniels has at least one game in him. Yeah, where he just goes off and just surprises. The, there are always those games in the Big 12 where one team just comes in and just one team is off and the other team just blows up. Right. I think JT Daniels has that game in this one. And they get tripped up here. Mm -hmm. That's eight and three. And then I think they beat Kansas in the rivalry game. And I think they're nine and three. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Big, big surprise. I could be wrong. Trusting Adrian Martinez this much <laughs> could be a head scratcher for a lot of people. Yeah. I trust Chris Kleiman. I trust Deuce Vaughn. I think what they have and how stable they are can help Adrian Martinez and his talent level go higher. And I trust how how disciplined and tough that defense is on a consistent basis. Right. I think that they surprise and go nine and three. All righty. That gets them into the Big 12 championship. So, there's three teams left. Actually, four. So, actually, yeah, four. So, I got to hurry up. West Virginia. The whole question is, can JT Daniels and Graham Harrell save them from this situation? Um, Neil Brown has been their coach for the past three years. A lot of hype coming in out of Troy. Hasn't been able to get it on track. The defenses have been really good, but the offenses have been bad to worse. That's the whole question, honestly. I mean, there's there's not much more to it besides can JT Daniels and Graham Harrell as a quarterback and offensive coordinator duo save them. Right. And I don't think they do enough to get them to where they want to go. I think they could beat Pittsburgh week one, but I'd most likely take Pittsburgh. I'll take them over Kansas week two. Towson week three, win. Virginia Tech week four, that's a toss-up, even though they're in a complete re reload, too. So I'll, I will give them three and one. Next, Texas, I think that's a loss. Baylor, loss. Texas Tech, I think, is a loss. TCU, I think, is a win. Iowa State, I think, is a loss. Oklahoma's, I think, is a loss. I said Kansas State, I think, is a loss. And Oklahoma State, loss. Hmm. So that's not making a bowl game. No. Actually, I, I said that Kansas State game was a win. I'm sorry. 
So that's like that's five wins. It's worse. <laughs> I think that's five wins. Right on the edge of six and six. Not enough for for Neil Brown. He's on a red hot seat. Yeah. Close to getting fired. Uh, West Virginia. Already said them. Next Texas Tech. Matt Wells got fired after actually being pretty good at Texas Tech, but he wasn't enough. They bring in Joey McGuire from Baylor because they believe he's the guy that can get them on a the next level of recruiting and bring in all those high level talent guys. They also bring in Zach Kitley, who, if people don't know, he was brought in as the offensive coordinator at Western Kentucky last year because they lit up Texas Tech at Houston Baptist. They brought him from Houston Baptist along with um, the quarterback that just, that just got drafted by the Patriots, threw for over 6,000 yards and 50 touchdowns. Bailey Zappi. Bailey Zappi. They brought in him and Zach Kitley and a few receivers, and they just lit up the Conference USA. So now Zach Kitley is at Texas Tech. They have multiple good QB options, and Taylor's, Taylor Shuck, Donovan Smith, and Baron Morton. Baron Morton hasn't played, but he's the highest recruited out of the bunch. Donovan Smith is the most – Talented physically, he's 6'5", 230, big arm, athletic. And Tyler Shuck is the most experienced. They'll have to decide who the quarterbacks are. They brought in a ton of transfers to try to help the defense because the defense has been terrible for a long time. Whoever they choose at quarterback, I believe it won't be a hard transition for them because that's Zach Kitley offense. And Red, Texas Tech always has pretty good to really good receivers. So... I think this is a team that could possibly make a bowl game and go six and six or seven and five. I think they they beat Murray State week one. I think they lose to Houston week two, and I think they lose to NC State week three. I think they could clip up Texas. They lose to Kansas State. I think they lose to Oklahoma State, but I think they could rattle off wins against West Virginia. They could trip up Baylor. I think they beat TCU. They beat uh, Kansas. Could could beat Iowa State. Lose to Oklahoma. I think there's a six and six chance there. There's a really good six and six chance. I believe in their offense. And that's about it. All right. We only have like a minute. So good. Kansas, it's, it's, TCU, just quick, quick synopsis. TCU. New coach Sonny Dykes from SMU. It's a it's a real like kind of it's more of a rebuild than a retool. You got Max Duggan who hasn't lived up to his potential as a quarterback. You also got Chandler Morris, who had a huge game last year against Baylor and tripped him up. You got Quentin Johnston, who's a huge NFL-like level receiver. But you leave uh, Zach Evans transferred to Ole Miss and a few good pieces on defense. I think they most likely win only like five games. Kansas, huge rebuild. Lance Leopold is finally the coach that they need to have at Kansas but he's like two years away from being two years away from making a bowl game. I like Jalen Daniels and Devin Neal as young quarterback and receiver. I mean, quarterback and running back. They brought in some good transfers on offense and defense, but it won't be enough to make a bowl game. If they win four games, it's a huge successful season. I think it's most likely three. Unfortunate for the Jayhawks. Oklahoma, Kansas State, best teams in the Big 12 this season with Texas and Oklahoma State right behind them. All right. Yes. That's the Big 12 preview. We'll get another conference next week. And there was breaking news while you are talking. Paige Buchers of UConn women's basketball tore ACL after she just got a million-dollar well, NIL that's a, deal. That's a terrible way. And, that's uh, a sad way to end this. Yeah. And apparently in a pickup game. So a random pickup game. That's like, so she will miss her 2022-2023 season. She still might be the number one pick, but man, that's nice. she, she very she's well could be. Um, but yeah, sad for women's basketball because she's one of the highlights. Anyway, this has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next week. Texas still is not back. Give it another year or two, Texas fans. It might happen, but it also might